are listening to the one of us.net podcast network. One of us.net has been your one stop shop for all things geek for years, but there's a side to them many of you have never heard the subscription side. Subscribe and listen to great podcasts like The Breakfast Pub, The Original Gentleman, and the Watch a Movie With Us series. Head on over to oneofus.net and don't forget your towel. <laughs> it is the deliberations of doom. That's all I got. Yeah, that was so. <laughs> I didn't know creepy. that was going to happen. Oh my gosh! Episode seven? Eight. Question mark? I think it's seven. Okay, okay. I, I think that's right. Really? But yeah, this uh, as we do as is our want. We switch back and forth from like a uh, idea that goes across multiple types of horror movies to a creator or a singular person, and this is our singular person episode. In which case, we are we'll be talking about the legendary. And sometimes legendarily disappointing, John Carpenter. <laughs> well, let's be honest. His Twitter is literally um, Matt Horror Master. Yeah, is his Twitter. I, okay, and yeah. who would dispute that? I'm, I'm okay with that. No one on this couch says a lot about the man. <laughs> they are on a different couch than this, by the way. There's more than one couch in here, and one okay. couch is a uh, dissenting couch. Is Fan Carpenter wearing matching? Well, not matching, but Carpenter. Choose your side wisely. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but going around, because this is the first episode we're opening up to everyone for free, you can listen to. And now, if you're listening to this, you can go back and uh, find, check out, you can, you can just go on oneofus.net and put Deliberations of Doom or, or do the pull-down menu and all of those episodes, or previous episodes, are we now are free, free to listen to. We're free. So you can listen to all these episodes. We have been we're free. actually, we're proud of this show. We like this show. Shout we, out to all my friends who are finally actually going to listen to this now. Yeah, <laughs> I, do, I do think we're biased. Oh, too cheap poor to pay. <laughs> I know, they're too poor to pay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, but yeah, this one, poor drink out for all the rich bastards who are like, oh, man, I spent money on that shit. I know. Shit. It's uh, got like $2 a month on your guys'. But, yeah, I feel like we're intense shitty. horror movie people, and I'm Chris. Patience. Philip. Russell. Rob. And we all have pretty differing opinions a lot of the time about what's good and what's bad in horror, which I think partially what makes this show fun and interesting. It's almost like it's subjective or something. Almost. <laughs> First off, shout Not out... Not on this couch. <laughs> shout out to everyone but me for having stuff that just came out recently. Uh, Patience, Ooh. you just had a short story published. Correct. A horror story. Yes. Um, spring 2017 issue of Dark Gothic Resurrected. It's a mature content... I want to say that right away. Um, <laughs> awesome. Magazine. Um, the little children Trump. listening yeah. to the horror podcast. Yeah, right. <laughs> For all you kiddies out there. Right? It's, so, short story, Roses of Blood, came out uh, two weeks ago. So if your five-year-old is listening to Little Don't of Don't let Doom. them read my story, please. <laughs> or that magazine, because it's mature. It's erotica. All right. Uh, it's, it's more, it's more erotic. You're selling it. You're yeah. selling it. So I'm in. It's I'm like in. those Anne Rice, the like, Princess no, Sleeping Beauty no, things. No, 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 no. Not that erotic. No. No. Fair enough. Gotcha. All, All right, right. selling it even more. Yeah. Right, I'm in. I'm and in. then Phil has... Phil, Phil, yeah, you got yeah. a thing. Yeah, I've got a movie coming out May 12th, uh, Dead Awake. Um, yeah, so it'll be at a couple theaters, non-VOD, so yeah. look out for that. May 12th. And, May 12th. Yeah, you're May 12th. the director and co I'm the director, uh, yeah, and uh, it's written by uh, Jeffrey Reddick, the guy who created Final Destination. So, uh, cool movie about sleep paralysis. Check and it starring out. Starring one of my favorite horror actresses right now who looks like a young Jessica Harper. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Totally. For sure. They keep, you know, they're talking about the new Suspiria. I'm like, that's her. Put her in that. <laughs> oh, yeah. She jo- looks like Jessica Harper. Jocelyn Donahue. Yeah, you might know her from House of the Devil and yeah. uh, Insidious so 2. Good. She's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, she's great. She's the, yeah, she's in the Burrows too. Yeah, she's in the Burrows. Oh, as well. that's right. She yeah. was in the Burrows and Frontiers. She, she's a great actress. There's a the Burrows. That's a little callback. The guys who are maybe new to indie horror, <laughs> seek that one out. Yeah, definitely. That was really good. Yeah. Go. It's, it's Tremors in the Old West, yep. basically. Yeah. 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 So props to Phil. Good cast. Good job. Yeah. Thank you. Thank and then the you. Summers Brothers here have a short that's now going around, a horror short that's going around, or a sci-fi short. Well, yeah. Well, we have two. So we have one called The Bench, uh, which 
has screened in um, multiple film festivals, including uh, the Excellent Other Worlds uh, Festival here in Austin, which is a sci-fi horror fest. And um, that'll be online soon. We'll probably post it for everybody to check out because uh, it's kind of done with the festival rounds. And then um, we have another one called Couples Night, which is just starting to make festival rounds. Uh, probably the next one we can tell you what festivals it's going to be in, but they told us to wait. So we got in a couple. So it's good stuff. Congrats, yeah, man. Thanks, nice. guys. Congrats. Excited about awesome. That. And for me, my cats love me. They do. <laughs> That's they do. my accomplishment. They do. They're like, you're great. You feed us. I mean, as much as a cat can love anyone. As much as they're <laughs> capable of love. Hey, I saw a new study that says cats actually prefer companionship of their owner to food, but then it specified, well, the owner that feeds them. <laughs> uh, right. Let's get to the carpenter. Uh, well, we've got to start off, as we do every week, with a review of a current horror film that came out. And this one actually just <laughs> seems too perfect because of comparisons to Carpenter, mm-hmm, which were mm-hmm. inevitable. And that is the film The Void. Uh, this is something I saw originally at Fantastic Fest. I did make a point of just re-watching it just the other day because I was like, you know, I've heard so many differing opinions about this film since I saw it where I was kind of 50-50 on it. I was like, maybe I should go back and give this another shot. I feel like I was a little warmer to this film the second time, but not by a sizable margin. I'm maybe 60-40 now. And I was positive. dying to to watch this. I've asked to get the free link for this for like the last three podcasts. Literally like yeah. the day after you watched it, they sent me a link. Yeah, of course. And it was like, after I bought it. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, this that is, didn't color my opinion at all. <laughs> this is written and directed by uh, Jeremy Gillespie and Steve Katansky. The idea being, well, I, you know, I've been talking this whole thing. Somebody else start with this. Here. Well, What's the first of all, they've never actually done a movie before. They are like makeup and set designers. No, I think they did Manborg. Can we check? That? They've done a couple, a couple they were shorts, like kind of a low budget. Okay, a couple but shorts. Did they do Manborg? And they also did one of those ABCs of Death thing. I thought right. It's yeah. possible. As I directors? couldn't find anything really on as them directors. as directors. Really? Yeah. Father's Day, yeah. Good Father's, Father's Day. Day. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. Which no one has seen. <laughs> yeah. So, it's um, there. so the plot is that uh, this cop finds a uh, dude, I guess, out in the middle of the forest who's crawling around, along the side of the road, takes him to the hospital, right? Is I can't Patience remember. Patience is like killing the block. Of you watch this film? <laughs> Basically, there's a local police officer who Thank finds you, like Rob. a bloody person in the middle of the road, takes him to the, exactly she says takes to this to hospital, hospital, and uh, hilarity ensues. Um, it becomes <laughs> apparent that this guy is part of a much larger, darker conspiracy uh, of. Death that, and al- horror. that doesn't always make sense. Yes. Um, Look, this is definitely for me watching this, these directors going, We really like the thing and we really like Prince of Darkness. What if we smushed them together? It was very movie? Carpenter with the self mutilation, and I mean, it was, and it had a Lovecraftian <laughs> vibe, I guess you could say. But no, you're so making patience. Faces. Don't hold Come back. On. Tell us what uh, you uh, Did you like the movie? movie? Wait, Phil's making faces <laughs> and it's making me laugh. Like, I don't look at Phil. Um, I mean, this movie. Uh, it's on that borderline of where things get almost too gross for me, like very Hellraiser-ish. Oh, definitely. Definitely. To where it definitely was so like, good. you know, let me just watch this man, like, shove his face over and over into, like, some pointed thing and watch his brains ooze out for, like... I mean, it, it was it was good from a special effects point of view, and I was borderline not liking it, but at the same time, they kept some integrity with the artistic choices and the flashbacks and the visions that some people hated. I actually liked it, and it made me actually like the movie because they didn't just... Uh, make just a uh i guess a straight up gore fest it actually had some subplot and a lot of backstory which a lot of people hated the backstory because most of the story was in backstory like you're like you're watching a very simple movie but hell man there must have been about another hundred pages of, of backstory that they, right. they left out and they this, kept showing yeah, flashbacks this felt like the type of movie where they've already written a 12 issue comic book series mm-hmm. to go with yeah so you know? so i yeah. you said hellraiser because i actually do have in my notes that i i like had a strong cinnabite sort of vibe for it, 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 in, the, the, in the last act last yeah, sure. last last it sure. definitely grossed me out to the point where i don't i mean i i prefer like halloween type horror mm-hmm. where i'm not watching just as mutilated human being like all that being said yeah. you like the thing yeah but the thing wasn't it was way more tasteful way more tasteful if you are a critics fan at the time, which is not a, which is not an adjective the thing gets a lot critics, <laughs> at, yeah, critics at the time called it obscenely violent I mean <laughs> so 
I mean, if you're a fan of practical effects, I would say you should oh, watch that's this. Oh, sure. Because that's the sure. practical yeah. effects the practical in this effects were fantastic. Are, that's the number one attraction for me for this thing, was that, yeah, the, the monsters, the actual practical monsters, they look really fucking cool. Yeah, yeah. But so, that's so otherwise... I mean, damning with faint praise. No, but I mean, like... special effects are good. People who really love Lovecraftian <laughs> stuff yeah, wait, 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 can are we going all... to dig on this, I think. So, I don't, I don't know if I've been, like, I, I feel like w- what, <coughs> what happens in the film is... They get to the hospital and they realize this guy's part of this large, con- like this sort of conspiracy, and these hooded figures. I would say it's like a cult, right? Like a cult, and they sort of uh, they appear outside. And there's a backstory, as Phil was talking about, that uh, the police officer finds him. His wife work or his ex-wife works there. They've lost their child, and um, slowly they begin to realize like something is up. Like, well, I don't even know. It's slowly, right? But rather quickly, yeah. in fact. Um, but. I really so I was really excited about this movie. I think it is a terrific trailer, so you should like check out the trailer, Agreed. see if it interests you. Um, I think the people that got the trailer really got uh, the ideas that they were going for. The movie isn't exactly the trailer. I think um, my biggest complaint about the movie was I felt um, there was some confusing plot stuff. Oh, for sure. Definitely. Did anybody? Okay, so I, there I, were some very muddled characters who appear about a third of the way into the movie, right? And their motivations and their backstory are somewhat murky and are never quite really explained. Does anybody else? Because I, I just want to—I don't want to spoil too much, but there's like an older guy and a younger guy who appear at the beginning and then sort of show up at the hospital. They never explain <laughs> what the fuck. No. They, and, yeah. and they, they, they sort of imply some stuff that the is older going guy on. I found the younger guy. So no one. Okay. I, I don't so know. so this is funny because I've actually talked to a bunch of people who've seen the movie. Mm-hmm. Nobody understands what's going on here because I was really like this thing like I missed something right like what happened and Russ is like I don't know what happened and then uh, I'm asking all of y'all see, and y'all don't know what I, happened. I, I kind of got what happened. Like, they were attacked by a similar, like, the cult thing similarly that happened to, what's happening to right. them. The old man gets away with the son, and you see, like, flashbacks of that later on, and they're trying to, like, snuff out the rest of this cult, but he, and they know that the head's his son? Because yeah. I almost felt like it was, like, his, his son. son-in-law. I think it's his son. I, I mean, as far as what it shows, I, I he's saw, there protecting his mom like, or something in the flashback. They're literally called father and son, the father yeah. and the son. In credit? In, in, in the, yeah. yeah, in the credit. So, to me, it's, that's, yeah, that's, so, that's so literally So, I feel like, and then, so there's also a mother somewhere. There is a twist in the flashback about who is behind what the this sort of thing that's happening, and it sort of shrinks the film scope, um, which is like, in other words, it becomes a, it's a character who you already know, and it feels sort of weird, like almost silly. You're like, this is the guy behind everything. Um, and, yeah, and, and I feel like because it, it would have just been better to. Um, Make it just some random person, almost, right? Am I? Yeah. I mean, like, yeah. And instead, it's like they almost feel like they want to do a twist. <laughs> so that threw me. Both those things, and I think it was a thing where I didn't necessarily mind the choice, but I kind of needed more explanation that the movie never really gives. I mean, and it's not trying for ambiguity. I feel like it's actually just it's I not either clear. got like hacked to death in editing or the screenplay. I don't was think just so. Right yeah, in. the editing didn't seem like the problem. I don't. Th- it's not that. Just, I think they wanted to keep a certain level of ambiguity to go with the type of Lovecraft right. plot, well. but it didn't quite get it where it needed he, to be. Here, here's kind of like where I had my my big problem with it is. Like, in watching a movie like Hellraiser, you have a demonic creature that brings all this evil upon, you know, the people that open the box. And all. You have, you have that, this demonic creature that is the one in charge. In watching this movie, not to give away, there's a character who maybe lost somebody mm-hmm. and finds a tome that's going to bring something back to life. And that's your goal. But all of a sudden it turns this absolute evil gore fest of demonic hell and you're okay with that. And you're just gonna keep like keeping like doing tests on people because you missed your daughter, and you're gonna keep like keep them alive. <laughs> and it's a spoiler it's, alert. <laughs> I mean, but you could make that same yeah, argument for I mean, like I, Frank and Hellraiser. You're but like, I, really, so, you're still going with this after everything. You've I just, seen? I, it's just so <laughs> just gory okay, though. So, that how can your mind just go from I miss my girl to <laughs> here's what I've I mean, created to a certain yeah. extent. I didn't actually this should be gore. one of my favorite movies I've seen this year. Like, I love the premise. It has this great Carpenter feeling where the beginning is sort of assault on Precinct 13. Yeah, it's, it's except a, instead of a gang, it's like this cult. It's a siege on a yeah. hospital. Lots and the, last the third, third is happening in right. the middle of it. And then yeah. the last third turns into this somewhat Lovecraftian thing yeah. uh, type uh, a story. But it's 
it's actually the last third was was actually stunning to me as like a, a low budget I filmmaker. I actually thought the last like, two minutes was the best. Well, I mean, it looks thing. amazing. It's literally so, you got to put an asterisk next to these guys are state of the art special and, effects. And, like, and, I mean, and they work on huge movies. And I think yeah. you and, but, and you you feel that from the oh, film. It's, it's a big. It's beautifully yeah. shot. The, I would say the special effects are better than movies. Oh of, yeah, a gigantic. You're story. talking about they, they've got a twenty million dollar like like look to their movie yeah. because yeah. they brought in an A list. It delivered. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. As much as some of the Great best stuff effects. is yeah. in the last third, the stuff that doesn't work is in the last third as well. Right. Agreed. Which I think is partially falling back on a, a horror movie chestnut uh, where, oh, they're ch- being shoved into like, oh, this is like something that happened to you before so we can give some character background to you, but it's Hell's version of it. And I'm like... This is such an old trick, and I, we know right It's very hard to discuss everything as, you're talking about without giving away I everything. Know. Yeah. As ambiguous as the movie tries to be, I thought it was, like, a, completely predictable. I mean, I just was, Agreed. like... I mean, I literally was bored to death. Wow. Was the, just, whole, the whole time? I pretty much, I was okay, bored. Okay, so, because I'm a little... Because I want to be I thought it was pretty... But I was bored. So you were bored. So yeah. you don't, Chris. You were not bored. I, I enjoyed it, but felt like, wow, this is an almost ran. There's yeah. so many little errors all throughout this thing that make it not quite work, and it's such a shame. It's almost more disappointing because it's so close to being a great horror film. It okay. could have been, a great yeah. but it has film. things that are big enough that like. Like wow, you just undercut what was working, and then it ends in an Asia album cover. So yeah. <laughs> I almost sorry to my right now. That's amazing. I, uh, put that on the poster. I know, right? but, so wait, so I, you, I, did I, you like it? I actually really liked it. Only like to me, only because. They made really intelligent choices with the editing, I thought. I actually enjoyed some of the flashbacks and symbolism of what was going on. And that made me, like, if they didn't have, like, that extra style to it, I would have been like, it's just pure style over content. Because it would have just been, like, mm. great special effects and bad storytelling. But because they did add that backstory, it let me think about the movie. And right. I, because of that, I appreciate it. I mean, if I had a 1 to 10 rating, I'd give it a 7.5 to 8. I mean, I enjoyed it. I was thinking well, that's pretty like high, Russ. Yes. You... No, I, I listen. I thought for for the movie that I kind of hoped it would be, um, I did think it kind of delivered on that. Um, it was fun. Yeah, it, it was, was fun. fun. It, I felt like the the special effects were really cool. There was a lot of really great ideas. The, I, I mean, the biggest problem is that the story is somewhat muddled, and I don't know that that feels intentional. So some of the ambiguity feels like a, a script problem more than... 100%. Yeah, than a sort of di- directorial problem. And I think that's the biggest problem in the movie that sort of takes me out of it. Nailed it. Yeah, but I... I you get these guys a proper script, they're going to knock something out of the park. Totally. I and mean, I'm... I, listen, or... I think if you're, if you're at home and you want to watch a horror movie and you're in a John Carpenter kind of mood... Which I always am. <laughs> um, I would watch Unless this movie. We're talking about Ghosts of Mars. Yes, and we'll get to that. <laughs> and I, I felt like it scratched that itch, and, and that was enough for me to forgive the flaws in the movie, which I totally cop to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a good summation. I, I, I was really excited for this movie. Seeing the trailer, I, I do feel like Russ said, like I was confused by some of it. They made some choices. I didn't love the lead, the cop. I mean. He just didn't totally nail it as an actor, um, and I don't know. If that's everything is his, his fault. Um, yeah, but, he could have used a more charismatic lead. Yeah, for he sure. felt like a low budget indie lead. And whereas most of the supporting cast, especially the guy that turns out to be the bad guy, when he goes third he's act, like he's really good. Yeah, yeah. Like I was like, wow, he's like covered in makeup. And his like, voice he, changed later yeah, on when he's he talking. He was like, was, yeah. it, was it the same actor? I hope yeah, 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 it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> his voice later on gets real creepy. And, um, when he's you know, doing like the like the diatribe. Oh yeah, he's, he's like you know telling what? you what Honestly, he's gonna do. I would yeah. have to say, despite patients' misgivings, which are probably founded in some ways, sure. I think some people will probably have some reservations watching the movie. Certainly. I would say if you listen to this podcast, I would go out of your way to see this movie only because I think you wanna see a low budget horror movie that's not like a lot of other stuff with amazing practical effects. This is kind of that movie. Despite its plot 
like problems and Russ and I, I mean we talked about this movie a lot like I was like really so what happened but I th- but I also thought about the movie a lot and if I think about a movie after I see it I kind of have to say it was worth watching do you ever think that they had like a really cool like special effects rig and they're like fuck it let's write a story around this rig right. like I mean like it felt like they had a really cool like let's- we already got this monster made with this crazy thing let's just write that in there because I mean, it felt that way at times there are worse reasons to do a movie than that you're right, right. Yeah. you're right actually my big thing was like at the end like the end takes place again. I don't know how to say stuff to me. Spoiler: The end Asia takes place. Album look, just, <laughs> but no, but before that, just the geography of where the climax takes place, the last third. You're just like, really? That makes no sense. It's just. So but that's it's, like, it's sort of downstairs. Yeah. You're like, it's just sort of like, really? I mean, like, it has one of those things where, like, one of the great, the the scary moments in this is I was like, okay, we're going down the second set of stairs, and a character goes. There there's a second set of stairs. There there's stairs. no other stairs in there. And you're like, Again, oh, you're, you're, you're going, oh, yeah, you're like, that's a point where you're like, oh, the tone of this movie has suddenly shifted from the thing to Hellraiser. Yeah. And that's this dividing mark in the film or in the mouth of madness. And I would recommend this film to people who consider Prince themselves darkness. huge Prince fans darkness. of Clyde Barker's movies, huge fans mm-hmm. of John Carpenter films, or huge fans of Lovecraft films. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think all of them will come out kind of like somewhere where we are, somewhere from the middle to two thirds. If it's like it's, it's not great, but yeah. it's pretty good. It's pretty good. There's, it's, there's, there's greatness in it. Yeah. But it is not in itself great. It's, I look forward to seeing what these guys do next. Yeah, amen. Because this is a I solid mean, that's their shot debut, across exactly. the bow. Exactly. Yeah. Their debut film's fantastic. It's an We're... impressive shot across the bow. Yeah. No. I was just a little, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to move on here. I, I, I know. I just, I just, I think that my problem was that I was, it was overhyped to me. Um, I am, like, I follow uh, the. See, horror. now I don't want you to watch The Devil's Candy because right? I've been talking about it for like six months. So much. Yeah. Um, but the horror subreddit, Dreadit, is actually what's called Loves This Movie. And I was just like super hyped. And then I was mm. like, not. So I think that's my problem. Oh, horror fans love good practical effects. That's they do. true, Case and, and I do the that'll get you four to five stars every time. <laughs> I would watch this again just to see the practical effects. So there's. I that. mean, I like. So I would effects. say we're seeing compared to all, some of the other movies we've watched. You know, <laughs> this is true. This, this, this is, is pretty very freaking true. good. This is way Agreed. better. Yeah, than for some low of the budget, we've seen modern. In fact, I think this is the best one probably. I would definitely for sure. Yeah. For sure, this this was, was, not even close. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we was, make it sound like we didn't like it. We all kind of did a little. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> exactly, like that's what I'm trying yeah. to. Is the heart of it? Like, there's a lot. It's hard to talk. It's hard to talk about something without talking about what you didn't like about yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. You know. Yeah. All right, well, let's move on to the career of John Carpenter. Yay! Oh, Summers Brothers are (laughs) so happy. They've been craving for this episode. Uh, He went went to USC for, for cinema... And there actually dropped out because after doing producing a short for Dark Stars, a uh, very just post-2001, but pre-Star Wars thing, he got money to make it into a feature. And he's like, well, fuck it, I'm done, obviously. I, people are giving me money from Hollywood, so I'm going to go make a make a feature movie. Who needs never, school? Never graduated. Put that out in Stay in school, kids. Put that out in 1975, <laughs> or not. which was a minor but midnight movie hit. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, definitely something that people were talking about. Like, mm-hmm. well, you should go see Dark Star. It's like a parody of 2001. Um, followed up by Assault on Precinct 13, yeah, which yeah. was his shot across the bow to say, by the way, I'm a big fan of Howard Hawks, <laughs> who would continue to influence his career throughout. Mm-hmm. You know, not even to the point of remaking one of his movies. Or just modeling his career on his approach. Agreed. Uh, but that 1976 was a, a pretty big, like, another midnight movie hit, but one that had resonance. And then he moved on to what you could still say is arguably his most important, well, not even arguably, it was his most important film. Mm -hmm. The one that resonated through the decades and still has an effect. A game changer, which was Halloween in 1978. Oh, I've never heard of it. No, really? Uh, It's it's, it's, it's pretty good. You should check it out. Halloween. Oh, okay. It's one of those weird movies. so strange. When I saw it the first time, I, I was like, Okay, I get it. I've seen lots of Friday the 13th movies before I saw it, and I was like, it's another one of these. And it wasn't until years later watching it with a better appreciation of cinema going, wow, this is kind of a fucking masterpiece. I mean, it's been accepted into the Library of Congress at this point for being uh, no, no, culturally, it, 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 historically, yeah. or aesthetically significant. Yeah, they're storing it in, like, the salt mines to preserve it for <laughs> fucking eternity. Seriously. I mean, I would actually argue that and this is, like, should. the first yeah. slasher, the first real slasher Well, film. the first real American slasher. There you go. Because there's, there had already been, I think, two Italian I, films that definitely he was 
borrowing from. So my and my Black understanding, Christmas was also yeah, Black yeah. Christmas. Yeah. Well, you know, when he first came up with the idea with this, he approached the guy from Black Christmas and said, "I want to do a sequel to Black Christmas," and this was first in his head conceived of as a sequel to Black Christmas, and then it went way maybe way the off first that. mainstream slasher. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting because a lot of Carpenter's careers like influenced by something else. Oh, and like like everything's inf- like I mean, he made like twelve Rio Bravos. Every movie, I mean, he really did. <laughs> Every movie has a hundred references to other things in it. But yeah, like yeah, for sure, he's definitely a big fan of other filmmakers, and he's the first to admit it as well. But I mean, you look at his entire body of work; Halloween is his greatest accomplishment, in my opinion. Absolutely. Oh yeah. Had the thing been an original concept, I say the thing would be it. Yeah. But because it was a remake of Hawks, I think Halloween is the pinnacle of John Carpenter films. I mean, the thing is the pinnacle of practical effects work in a, in a movie. I think sure, uh, and, and I think in many ways it's like I mean influenced so much stuff that came after in such a huge way, and is only now really making its real effects felt. I think in yeah. some ways, but like Halloween, in so many like very specific, just the way that things are filmed in horror, yeah. the concepts, the idea, of the final girl, the doing he was the first American film to uh, other than Black Christmas to show the through the viewpoint of the killer. Right. You know now, now that's what I was gonna say as well, and this is gonna be an ongoing thing throughout the podcast is um when you watch Halloween and a lot of his earlier work like The Fog and Christine and, and so on you're going to see a lot of like ingenuity in the actual cinematography and what he was doing with the camera and how he's playing with the lighting. And you start to see that drop off around 1987 mm-hmm. and different things start happening. Like when you watch actually the look of the film changes drastically. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we'll talk about it later as we go on, but this to me, when you watch like, it, you know, even the fog going on to the next one, but it's like you, you see a true artist director making movies who loves what he does and he's not burnt out by people, uh, not appreciating him. And you, you get this early on because he's a very jaded filmmaker. He's definitely somebody who... Uh, he dropped out because he was jaded. Yeah, oh, yeah. for sure. And you can tell like some jobs he does just to do a job. But Halloween, you can tell that there is passion there. There's creativity there. There's good actors there, which is a big part, too. A lot of times he doesn't have the best actors. He had good actors there. He, I mean, there's a career started with this movie. This was you know? a guy who was like us. He was a big geek for movies. Yeah. If he hadn't been a film director, he probably would have been a film critic. Mm-hmm. You know, he loved movies and... It's interesting now to see this movie that has been maybe the ultimate example of a film that's been overanalyzed to the point where it's become absurd. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. like it certainly has become the tar- target and the champion of feminist groups. We talked about this a little bit in our last episode, yeah. uh, uh, the uh, Final, uh, Final, Girls. Final Girls episode. But like the idea being that it is this morality play about sexuality, Carpenter himself has said, yeah, you guys all missed the point. He said, the one girl who's the most sexually uptight keeps stabbing the guy with a long knife. She's the most sexually frustrated. She's the one that's killed him. Not because she's a virgin, <laughs> but because of all that sexual repressed energy starts coming out. And she re- you know, turns around and uses the phallic symbols on the guy. I don't even, he's like, I don't even understand how you guys could picture this as being sexist. You know, which is uh, fascinating. But then he's also gone around, come back and said as well, you guys are just overthinking this whole fucking thing. It's a, we set out to make a horror movie that was scary. Because we like scary horror movies, and we felt like that's what we did, so relax. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's funny. I think that Halloween is... It probably, if you're listening to this podcast, you've seen Halloween. I, I, mean, I it, certainly hope it's, so. It's hard. <laughs> but, I mean, I think, like, it's hard to sort of get past its shadow on movies, period. I just think it's a movie we've all seen, and so it's hard to say something new or interesting about it. But at the same time, like, it's, you can't dismiss it. And I think, you know, there's a, it's basically a masterclass in filmmaking. Like, if you go back and you look at it, I mean, I remember Jamie Lee Curtis was on some interview talking about it or whatever. And she even says, like, there's, the crew is really small. It was like five or six, you know, ten people. Like, it really wasn't even a big people. And the guy that shot it, Dean Cundy, went on to shoot Jurassic Park. Mm. I mean, he is a. Amongst a, many a, other. Yeah, and not only that, but the thing, and if you think about some of the movies that guy shot, like, he's a big influence on giant movies. Um, it's also a movie that innovates using the Steadicam, which I think was still a fairly new invention. They used it in um, Rocky and a few other things. It became but, a standard for Carpenter. Right. Oh, for sure. But he used yeah. it, and I think what's great is that he was not he is not a gimmick guy. I think when you when you watch something like that, at least as far as his technical stuff, it serves the story. He uses it to do the POV at the beginning so that he can pull out of the house and put the mask on. And, that, that shot alone took two days. And it's it's a stunning wow. shot. And it's, it's not... Even now, I don't feel like you watch a lot of movies that have that kind of, that kind of thing where the story... 
and the technical come together in this way that um, really just tells the story and has an emotional impact. And Carpenter is so good at that. I think, like, that's what he excels at. And, um, you know, casting Jamie Lee Curtis, probably like we, like we talked about, he's a film nerd. So he cast her because, A, she's a good actress, but B, she's Janet Lee's daughter. So I think all that well, resonates. He, the he film. has said flat out, like she was not his first choice. Mm-hmm. Like he, and now I'm blanking on who his first choice was, but uh, another famous actress at the time. Oh, she it had was, never. Um, so she's SpaceX. So, no, it wasn't SpaceX. It was somebody else. It was definitely Carrie. So it was somebody else he had thought about, though, who was uh, like a big actress, like Deborah Winger or somebody like oh, okay. that. Hmm. Um, but he was talked into her, like giving her a try, even though she had only at that point, she was on a TV show and that was it because of who her mom was, which mm-hmm. was kind of like, look, like, we're a tiny little indie film that can't hurt to have like a, the one, the most famous scream queen. The daughter of a legend. You know, daughter yeah. of a legend. And, and the film that is definitely one of the biggest influences on this film, you know, Psycho mm-hmm. in this movie, for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, in fact, they played mother and daughter in the fog. Right. So, <laughs> which was it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now, now, question being, like, this movie still holds up today. Uh, when you uh, when absolutely. you watch it, yeah, it still holds up today. And I I want to like throughout this talk about that on other movies, like what changed and why some of his movies hold up and some don't. You can watch this one today, and it's still brilliant. It still has so much integrity, and, and everything feels truthful when you watch it. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, like, it, it, again, it's a master class, from the cinematography to the direction to the pacing. And to, how about the music? The music, it, I mean, well. that's the thing, too. <laughs> yeah. That's the thing, too. Like, when you watch, when he gets a, when he gets a movie right, the villain's right, the music's right, the lead actress is right, or actor, and the cinematography's right. You know, whether it be Kurt Russell or Jamie Lee Curtis. But it's like, he gets those things right, and they're... Masterclass perfection. Well, that's a, it gets one thing wrong, yeah. and it just feels like, "Whoa, what's going on here?" This is just a, one thing. This, this working. I mean, this for example, the Summers Brothers. He never gets anything. Uh, no, 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 I wouldn't say but, that. They've but seen I, body bags. But yeah, <laughs> but, but I think I think that, that's a fascinating point, and and I do think it holds up when we. I think like when we talk about directors, like I think the reason we talk about directors is the French kind of came up with this thing about the auteur theory. Like you could watch just a little bit of this movie and know that this person's influence was felt all over it. And I think Carpenter is that guy. I mean, you're talking about a guy like one of his things, and this is getting a little gear heady, but he always shoots in like CinemaScope. He always shoots uh, two, three, yeah. five, like, pan- wide anamorphic, screen, right? like, wide screen, wide screen. It's, it's really he actually spent an anamorphic pan- right. He spent a good portion of the budget for Halloween and the Fog right. to shoot in that and format that specifically. and I, and and you probably as an average moviegoer, you're not aware of it, and that's that's fine. Like you shouldn't be aware of it. But it's important to understand, like, as a person who's a movie fan, you see why he chooses that. And it changes what the movie is. It looks like a movie. It looks really cinematic. And then the fact that he comp- – there are not – I don't know any directors who compose their own score, much less have a specific sound like Carpenter. And I think, like, throughout this whole – his whole filmography – and this is the first one where, like – well, Assault on Precinct 13 has it as well. You have mm-hmm. this amazing electronic score where he's embracing this – specific sound and now it's everywhere everybody's yeah. stealing it so yeah. no that, that's that that's very true um that that john carpenter sound hell the john carpenter font yeah <laughs> <true>. yeah <laughs> albertus medium yeah. yeah albertus medium is that what it's called that is i've looked at i've, I've wow. i keep trying to rip it off because i'm like well should we use it on this movie and russ is like no man this isn't the movie <laughs> hold back hold back <laughs> yeah, i'm a fun so, yeah. halloween's beauty is in its simplicity both in its Amen. score yeah. and yeah. and just the how much it holds back even considering films that were considerably more bloody and violent than this beforehand that had come out already you're like it's remarkably reserved i, I mean he creates what... he creates a genre yeah yeah and i was going to say for those future filmmakers out there the plot is so simple mm-hmm. just un- tell a simple story well but not like, simplistic not simplistic it's just you know, it, it just it goes A B C D this dumb. Like I mean, it's not like backstory for a year. Tri- like There's everyone no tried to rip it off, and nobody got it There's right. No. It's just a simple story told well, man. Rob Zombie, God bless him, who like tried to remake it and thought, oh, now we'll tell you more about who Michael Myers is. It's like, well, then you never really understood. So how I want to kind of mention. Do you this. think we want to know more about what the evil is? The movie spells it out for you of like he's evil. 
don't worry about it. <laughs> and that's yeah, and I think scary. like that's another thing that is. I mean, Donald Pleasance's character is sort of the the person who hunts Myers is an amazing creation. Like, and Pleasance is great. Good, great. Actor. Um, it's a great character. But I, I did want to mention throughout Carpenter's stuff, this amazing thing that is part of his theme, which is a sort of originless, unknowable, endless evil that sort of is coming. And that is throughout, like, all... And it starts, like, here. There's just... It's a little bit in Assault in Precinct 13, even, as well as, like, the gang. Like, they, you don't know where they're from or what they want or whatever. They're just sort of there. And oh. I think Myers, he goes out of his way to say, like, you know, he's just he's just evil. And I think that's something Carpenter explores throughout his filmography. And, and how we reckon with that. Right. As a society or as a person. Yeah, it's not a matter of I'm too simple to understand complexities. There is real evil, and that's this. Right. <laughs> and he's a real person, as opposed to later Halloween movies where, or other slasher films where they end up being like this sort of like you know uh, supernatural character. Yeah. You know, the first Michael Myers I'd is say, is like a real person. I say in his way, he is a supernatural. Oh, for sure, I agree with that. I the, right from the beginning. I mean, like Pleasance's character, Sam Loomis. That. Right from the get go, is like you don't get it. He is not a man. Oh, yeah. He's from hell. He is from hell. He is uh-huh. whatever. He has no soul. The, the, the whatever he is, like it's not suggesting he's immortal, but it kind of does too. Like there's a famous story about at the end when they look down and, and, he's, down, and, the and he's gone. gone. Like the first Spoiler take, alert. Sam Loomis <laughs> was like supposed to like according to Carpenter supposed to look really surprised, and Pleasant said, "I don't think he would." Brilliant. Call. I think he yeah. would. Go, Brilliant call. He would look like, uh huh. I told you. Oh, well, okay. and, exactly. because, and they really went cool. with it because it was like, yeah, he already knows this guy isn't human. But could you know? any mortal man have a theme song that kick ass? <laughs> <laughs> no chance. <laughs> but then, 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 you gave no chance. That's which gotta is, be which somebody. is my alarm clock. That's... He, he showed, <laughs> it would be. It would be. <laughs> he showed a version of the That's film how you wake up. to yep. a group of critics in L.A. without the score, yeah. and they were bored by it. And were like, I don't really get it. And then... He asked them back again to see it once they had finished it, and all of them changed their opinion and went, that was great. And yeah. went, it was really the score that turned this whole movie around <laughs> so drastically. It was already a, okay, was movie, that, was, but this movie doesn't work without the was score. Was that the beginning of theme music for our our, our protagonists? <laughs> Maybe so. Um, and not only that, and I think if I remember correctly, it's in a weird time signature. It's like seven eighths or something yeah, it, like that. It's five something. I yeah, it's remember. not five a usual time. It's, it's like a syncopated like pace or whatever that isn't normal. And Carpenter chose it specifically. And I, again, I just think it's the. It shows when the guy has a vision. It's so strong and so specific, and it really works for the work, like the art that he's making. And that's why it's just so there, like resonant in it's, every horror. I mean, person's. everybody ripped. It. I mean, now you got yeah. Friday the Thirteenth and everything else mm-hmm. that comes after it. The no entire no horror genre. theme, with the possible exception of The Exorcist, has ever been yeah. as effective at getting under your skin and, as the yeah, thing. Yeah, and, and, and the intro shot to me is legendary. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean yeah. just to see that much murder happen yeah. as a child. I mean, and you know what? Great. It's it's a super fun movie. Yeah, like when you say like, "Hey, let's all get together, eat." pizza and watch a horror movie this is the movie that you're talking about yeah, yeah. you know agree yeah. i mean that's like it's like i watch fun, it every halloween scary yeah. <laughs> why, <laughs> why would you watch it it's great halloween? i don't get you're it you want to watch a halloween what episode I which one watch it on <laughs> one <Wednesday>. sweet <laughs> <laughs> that's my christmas morning movie yeah. uh, uh, right. just a few points of trivia that i thought were really genuinely fun about this before we move on nick castle who of the five actors in this film who played michael myers was the guy who was there most of the time he actually co-wrote Escape from New York with Carpenter. His name was used as one of the main characters in The Fog, and he performed with Carpenter and uh, Tommy Lee Wallace, who directed Halloween 3, the theme song to Big Trouble in Little China. <laughs> and he goes on to direct oh, does The he? Last Starfighter. He does. Oh, yeah, that's very true. I yeah. that. And The Boy Who Could Fly. And The Boy Who Could Fly. Did not like as well, he, Donald, could, he could not fly. Donald Pleasance <laughs> was not the first choice uh, for Sam Loomis. First he went to Peter Cushing, and then he went to Christopher Lee, Both who, who after amazing. the fact went on and said the greatest career mistake he ever made was not taking on wow. that role. Amen. Uh, also, Carpenter. <laughs> well, Pleasance is great. Yeah, Pleasance is fantastic so and good. went on to work He's with Carp- Carpenter in some great movies. Multiple yeah. films. Uh, this was co written with uh, Deborah Hill, who was the producer, who the only other film they worked on together outside of a producer status was Halloween 2, where the, they were in, deeper involved in the writing of that one. Didn't they write The Fog together? No, 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 the Halloween series. Oh, the Halloween series, yeah. yeah. yeah exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, By the way, Halloween about. three totally underrated. Yeah, Just great. Way overrated. Oh I get why people at the time freaked out because they were like, 
Where's Michael Myers? There's nothing to do with him, but it's a solid standalone. People in the eighties were just wrong. And our trilogy yeah. show will talk more about that. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's talk about his his next horror film. Mind you, we're because we're deliberations of doom, we're skipping past the stuff we didn't designate was specifically horror, some of which people will get mad at us about, but whatever. <laughs> Move on with your life. <laughs> is The Fog. Now I, I thought the fog is one of those movies that's like I it was a sophomore slump of a film in terms of horror. Oh, yeah. Where it was like, this isn't anywhere near as good as Halloween, but it was more than promising enough to show that this guy has some stu- in, like, stuff in his future. Am I being too nice? Yes. I mean, maybe <laughs> yes, know you what are. happens later. I actually liked The Fog. Whoa. I, I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Curveball. <laughs> All right, so a lot of people don't even know what The Fog is about, who cl- obviously didn't it's, go see the remake. Really, they don't no know from did. the name? Yeah. <laughs> well, but the name is fog. confusing, <laughs> because it's a ghost movie with an actual slasher in the, in the fog. It's yeah. weird. Right. Yeah. So, what, Patience, what do you describe with the plot um, of this one? Actually, this is well, sort of... Uh, <laughs> hey, can you pour me one, too? I will, yeah. Um, so, it's loosely based on a real story of a shipwreck. Um, that was off the coast of California, um, that was plundered in the 19th century. So they, um, on purpose, wrecked a ship so that they could steal from said ship. And this is the story of the vengeance of those uh, shipwrecked, I guess... The spirits of the sailors. Yeah. yeah, the spirits of the sailors. Thank you. Yeah. And, um, you know, a hundred years later, the small town is plagued by this fog full of ghosts that killed them. Yeah, um... Please. Yeah, as I'm far as super excited as far as story goes, it's not his best. And um, <laughs> but as far as like you know, again, like early in his career, he was making some really cool cinematic decisions. Like even from starting like the opening shots, just this watch dangling above the sea, and an old man telling the story, and children taking the story, and had some really cool uh, devices in there and cool shots. And you see like. Um, there's this great shot where this priest is talking to, like, his groundskeeper about something. And as the groundskeeper walks away, you see the priest's shadow. as like, this evil thing on the wall as he's drinking wine. And, and, <laughs> and it, it really cool decisions, really cool cinematic decisions he was making early on in his career. And, um, yeah, the weird thing to me, because it was a... <laughs> It's a ghost movie, but these ghosts have to knock on the door. <laughs> like, I mean, the fog Thank can go through every, every 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 crevice in the building. The fog's coming through. <laughs> every crease is going through, but yet they've got to knock, and they're always waiting with, like, a fish hook thing to, like, kill you. I mean, and I he wanted to create sort of a, like... A, a mariner's ghost story, a sort of very urban legend. Why do they need knives? Thing. And there's stuff like that. And you're oh my like, God, huh? seriously, like what? Uh, I mean, I, I don't think this is that was my void biggest of problem. cool stuff or anything. But it, it, there's so many points. I'm like, I'm just not understanding what you're going for here. Yeah. Or why I this is supposed nice, to be? Had a nice like small town ambiance about it. Uh, uh, again, Jamie Lee Curtis. <laughs> Jamie Lee Curtis plays the opposite of what she plays in Halloween. Yes. She's like a loose like. She has sex with the, <laughs> with the hitchhiker. The hitchhiker, yeah, the guy yeah, picked the, her up. Yeah. With Tom Atkins, who apparently every chick in the 80s wanted to sleep yeah. with, according to every <laughs> horror movie. Really? My fiance goes, who's the creepy guy? Dude, <laughs> she sleeps so with all the hot chicks. She sleeps with hot chicks. But it was, I just thought it was funny. It's like they clearly slept together, and then she's like, so what's your name? <laughs> I'm just like, what? It's, who dude, does that? You just, you just simple kill time. Him. Dude, ladies love the stash. Is that about Tom Atkins? Tom yeah. Atkins. Yeah. Who's playing the aforementioned Nick Castle yeah. character in this? Um, I'm and sweet let you... turtlenecks. Okay, I, can't, really... I can't wait to hear this I want to hear what you actually have to say first, Russ. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the fog. Uh, not because I don't like fog. Um, <laughs> I... I the the movie is problematic, especially I think as something as a carpenter completist, I understand when you want to watch the movie. Certainly, I do. Every time I watch the fog, there is a certain moment where I say, "Oh yeah, I remember why I hated this movie." <laughs> and it just um, it, it's bizarre to me. It it the script it, I don't think is particularly great. Um, it's creaky. It's just not. It's not sort of what you come to expect from from Carpenter, and as uh, uh, from a cinematography standpoint, from a design standpoint, it's really great to look at, um, and I like the idea, but I always 
find myself wanting more, and then at a certain point I find myself kind of bored, and I just don't want to watch it anymore. Well, I think part of the problem is they even knew when they finished filming it that this didn't work. They had to go back and reshoot. Famously, they went back to reshoots because both both the director, the writer, the the producers were like, this just isn't scary. Which is weird. (laughs) And and this is, is that when they added the guy in the fog with the knife? <laughs> I think, yeah, yeah, I think it is actually. Yeah. I mean, it's I think possible. it is. I think it is where people start. To I, yeah, no, I think face. it is obvious where there's sort of post-production stuff going and on. It wasn't even just they that. Had Apparently, to add gore it was like afterwards. like 78 minutes or something. The first oh, cut, geez. and they were like, "This has to be Dude, longer." It feels like two hours. So they added that whole John Houseman like like framing bit with him. Well, let me tell you a story about ghosts, kids. So which is a watched, great intro. Yeah, it so is a great I, intro. I watched this because my friend who was like a huge Carpenter fan was like, "Oh my god, we got to watch the fog." And like ran home, we watched it, and I was like, "This wasn't great." And as like a Carpenter fan, I was kind of like, "What the what the fuck." My biggest thing is it feels like like a Disney movie from the 70s. It, totally. oh, it feels it like Escape from vibe Witch Mountain. It, Ooh, that's yeah. true. it really does feel like you this. You can like, watch like, this while you're standing right. in line at the Haunted Mansion. Right, right. and it know? feels like it seems <laughs> like John Houseman, let me tell you a ghost story or whatever at the beginning, and then, you know, nothing is really that scary like I think like as a grown up you're kind of like this really isn't it's, it's not really that scary like if it had embraced its innocence it would have worked better but it feels like, like oddly it's, taking out of it when it does get really violent for a minute it's you're almost like, miscalculated yeah in that way and um again like there's way too many characters there isn't really a main character agree um, and, and I think like that could be interesting but at a certain point I'm not invested in the movie because I don't you know there's Adrian Barbeau in the in the radio tower, and then there's Tom Atkins and Jamie Lee Curtis. There's just uh, there's, then there's like then there's cops, a, and then there's, yeah, there's the kids, cops, and there's and like there's... Uh, 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 Jamie Lee Curtis's mom, uh, Janet Lee, and she's like running around trying to get some celebration going. And how Holbrook, and how yeah. Holbrook, who's really good, and I think like yeah. his stuff, by the way, was originally supposed to be Christopher, Christopher Lee, Lee yeah, which would have yeah. been yeah. awesome. Although Hal Holbrook, Holbrook is an amazing actor, he's, and he's, he's great. great. It's Mark Twain. Um, but yeah, <laughs> about about like I rewatched this on Shutter for the podcast. I don't think I'd seen it for year, like decades. Like I was like, oh, watch this. Um, total snooze. I don't even know if I finished it. Like I may have finished See, it, but now. you make a valid points. But I thought it. I like the innocence about it. Like Chris brought up the fact that it's sort of an innocent tale, and I, that's kind of what I liked about it. The small town feel. Uh, yeah. The the sort of Disney esque vibe I mean, to right. it. That and was I think one like, of the things I thought was appealing about the movie. I mean, I can't argue. But, but as a Carpenter movie, you uh, did you find it lacking? As a Carpenter movie, I I thought it was. Carpenter. I thought it was Damn. a very Carpenter movie. Sorry, guys. No, that's fine. But as a horror movie, I found it lacking. Yeah, I mean, it's not a particularly scary movie. I don't think the antagonists are terrifying in any way. Um, it does look great. Like, we were talking about, yeah. like, the I, he shoots this again. And, like, yeah, that anamorphic cinematography. Like, I did love watching the sort of 70s vision of the film. Like, I, I did love the look. But, um... You know, and I think, like, do do we find the score memorable? Nobody's talked about the score. It it, it was decent. It was decent. It wasn't one among... It's not one... I mean, compared to... That's what I'm saying. So, compared to the other Carpenter movies. No, I I feel like it's definitely not a scary movie to me, but I think it works, minus the fact you have to have a slasher in the fog. If you would have had a different, like, way to go about it, I think it could have been a better movie. But, I mean... Also, keep in mind, this is one of the first times that, like, the Catholic religion is being challenged, too, in his movies. Because he does it quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And this one really has to do with, oh, the priests of old, like, you know, screw over some sailors and take their money. And how can we celebrate? And you've got – and so it's definitely – I mean – It's funny. Russ and I talked about – we were sort of debating stuff on the way here. We we were talking about Carpenter's politics. And I was like, do you think he's conservative? Do you think he's liberal? (laughs) Like, because I think they live maybe – which I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but – is there and I think like if you talk to him, he would almost try and tell you like no, it's just it's just a ghost story. There aren't politics in it. I don't have you know that kind of vision of it or whatever. I think he tries to like really make like we were talking about Howard Hawks movies where it's like this is just a picture, kid. This is like a programmer from the studio. It's a horror movie with like ghosts and in a fog. But at the same time, <laughs> there yeah. are and ghosts with knives, right? <laughs> not really scary ghosts, but um. Uh, but I do think there are those ideas in that movie of mm-hmm. like again, and I think Carpenter is very, he's very much a maverick. He's distrust, distrustful of like corporations, of like big entities like that. Like, and his heroes are like that. I mean, I, I think agree. you look at like Snake Plissken, or you look at uh, 
uh, uh, Roddy, Roddy Roddy Piper's character in They Live, and I mm-hmm. think like they're not people who conform to society's things. They're sort of outsiders, and he's distrustful of institutions. And this movie is about those institutions. Like they were bad, they lied, they killed people, yeah. and I think those resonate throughout here. Even That's like really, you know, yeah. yeah it's so, almost like he's an anti-Hawks too, though. Where all of Hawks' characters are like good, upstanding yeah, people coming coming like together Hawks. to like you yeah, know like, make things right. You and John and, Wayne gonna make a picture. You yeah, know, <laughs> and everybody in Carpenter's movies are thinking the exact same situation. They're like the scum of the earth. Like right. you don't like them, and they come together, and you're like, oh, okay, so this could work. And I think, yeah. and I think that yeah. that speaks to his I agree with that. his yeah. the Western influence yeah. on Big. his horror film. I, I, I mean, totally. Definitely. All this guy wanted to make was westerns. They wouldn't make. They wouldn't let him yeah, after so Halloween. Or he wanted to make a western genre, and then he sticks in western. You know? Halloween happened. He's like, shit, I'm in a box, man. Like, I gotta just sit there this. and make horrors. No, it's true. He really did get caught into that. I mean, like, yeah. 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 like he was actually doing, re- getting in with his career to the point where he probably could have made a, a big budget Hollywood Western. And then one of my favorite films by him was a huge bomb, Big Trouble in Little China, and that killed his relationship I with I love Hollywood. that movie. It right. killed it. He never made a real Such Hollywood a picture classic. again after that. Yeah. You know? And that's also the same as, as Rob was just saying right now with these, like, anti heroes you know yeah big trouble in the little and i think he sees himself as that person i mean i think there's a very much a part of carpenter that's in there where it's like he is an indie filmmaker and throughout his life even when he makes giant studio films he's making independent movies Mm -hmm. he's you know he's being he's sort of like taking that low budget approach where like i'm kind of getting away with this man like a bunch of people like are in a room making a movie with me you know and i feel that in his filmmaking even (laughs) Even as horror films, yeah. which I think don't necessarily lend themselves to being westerns, but there's that that element is always until a little bit later. But yeah, maybe a little yeah, bit and like I that. think um, our next movie, The Thing, is probably one of his last films that we, you could really feel that passion. Mm-hmm. You know that like mm, I don't agree with that. Okay. So, so are we moving on to the uh, thing? Well, uh, yeah, let me just give the few notes. First off, the, the fog the lead was Adrian Barbeau. I didn't even realize. Is she realize. the lead? I, would, I don't think it's just the lead. Well, that she is because her voice is throughout every scene yeah, regardless. Which is cool. Actually, I he did want to mention quickly, her. like, the radio that. That thing was, written was a her. neat, like, thing yeah. that ties the movie together you wouldn't see anymore. I mean, maybe it's outdated, but it's neat as far as, like, a Did anybody movie. watch the remake, and is it better than the original? I have no. seen the uh, remake, terrible. and it's, terrible? It's, it's pretty terrible. It's, 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 do they still uh, have yeah, guys with eyes Rupert Rupert Wainwright, who yeah. directed um, Stigmata, and MC Hammer's You Can't Touch That. <laughs> oh, well, the well, knowledge that you just right there is impressive. I'm going to need a beer after that. That's just dropping some knowledge right now. Um... Yeah, no, it's it's bad. Just teenagers. Yeah, you know, and it's it's, it's PG thirteen, which uh, but it still it has Superman in it, right? Uh, no, no. Uh, yeah, it does. No, it's the guy from the, the Tom Welling, whatever Welling. Oh, Tom Welling. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Been a oh, poor guy. He doesn't get to be Superman anymore. That's Superman. <laughs> I was um, like Henry Cavill. You as well, this film is the first one where he references Lovecraft specifically twice, mm-hmm. uh, which it will happen throughout the rest of his career yeah. on and off. He references Wally Point, Whitley Wat- Point, and Arkham Reef both. That's right. References yeah. to Lovecraft there. Uh, I mentioned, of course, Christopher Lee already, and bringing us into the thing, he was already friends and worked with Rob Botton, who was a young up and coming special effects artist here, who actually plays the lead ghost in this movie, Blake. And he brought in Botton for his next film, the, the, the horror film, The Thing, to be his primary special effects artist, which was both the greatest thing that ever happened to Rob Botton and the worst thing that ever happened to Rob Botton, <laughs> who had so much work on The Thing, with even with a team of over 40 special effects artists working under him. And keep in mind, he was 22 years old when he started working on The Thing, that he had to go to the hospital for, for exhaustion, exhaustion. And his friend and mentor, Stan Winston, came in and worked on the whole sequence, the famous dog beast sequence, dog Great thing sequence. sequence. He did that sequence, but refused to take credit for it because he was like, this was Rob's idea. What a stand-up place. dude, man. Oh, you know, hey, man, I'm sure nice he's glad about every night he missed of sleep. <laughs> But I, can, yeah, I, mean, I can imagine there's no regrets. I mean, the thing is one of the, if not the greatest practical effects movie ever Abs- made. Absolutely. And, and it's super iconic. And okay, so we're moving on to the thing. Yeah. yeah. And it's so weird that when it came out, it was reviled by critics. I mean, like, across the board, hated by critics. They, well, they despised this movie, and it had the unfortunate 
Yeah. Uh, un- uh, it was. It came out the same like month as E. T. And, and the same weekend as Blade, Blade Runner. Runner. So. And it was Oof. like fuck. It was, yeah. I mean, man, take me back to 1982. That's a good day in the theater, Seriously, right there, man. Dude. It was, Imagine that's what your choices were for the weekend. Are we going to see Blade Runner? Are we going to see a thing? You know what? You, you, you just pay one fee and go see them all three. <laughs> all three right there. <laughs> this was also the first film that he didn't score, correct? Yes. Uh, oh yeah, search. Oh no, any of any of any of more. Yeah. He brought in to score the film, uh, who of course had been he, a major influence on him growing yeah. up. He Westerns right there again. The yeah, yeah. He, yeah. He did co-write Even some though of the he songs, did, he was on it the is, soundtrack. It really Carpenter does style. sound like Carpenter music. I mean, he basically makes a Carpenter score. Like a minor I don't know. trivia point: uh, two of the tracks that were never used by Morricone for this they used ended up being used in the Hateful Eight by Quentin, Quentin yeah. Tarantino, yeah. which is such a cool like. That's kind of that's well. When you watch Hateful Eight question. again, Carpenter's yeah. far-reaching influence. It's basically a remake of the thing. You know, yeah. I thought it was funny as I went on rewatch. I was like, "Holy shit!" I didn't even recognize Wilfred Brimley or Keith David. I'm like, "What? what? I, they're in the movie?" I. He didn't say diabetes once. I know, not even one time. He was, and he was also not morbidly obese. Well, I, I think that, but I think that's one of the things that's uh, Carpenter's strengths, and I think one of the things that's so great about the thing is cast. It's a, exactly it's a whole movie filled with character actors, like your favorite character actors in other movies are basically the leads in this film, and they are fantastic and given center stage. You, you know what you should do real quick. You should give a brief synopsis of the thing. Oh, there you go. We haven't done it yet. Yeah, we just jumped right into it. It's about a thing. You just automatically assumed that. I mean, you want to got- assume you people have seen the movie. It's about a wait, thing. Russ, go. Wait, Russ has a rule. He Every girl he's ever dated in the last like, no. 15, 20 years. That's the test. Russ, when, that's the first. No, that's whenever they say. You draw their yeah. blood and put in a vial and make sure it doesn't <laughs> jump out when you catch it on fire. <laughs> You know what? I was going to say something. I'm which just was the just, uh, which was the way cooler? Which was the first scene they filmed for this movie? Oh, Carpenter wow. wanted to test it because he wasn't sure it was going to work. And then everyone's super awkward, like there not is, having like a relationship with each other. That's one of the best other. scenes in a movie. For sure, it's yeah. so tense. But you guys, get, give the synopsis. Come on. Uh, the thing is about um, a uh, crew of, like I guess I would say, scientists mm-hmm. and their it's support team. Yeah, who are in um, Antarctica uh, right before winter. And they um, encounter uh, an animal from another site, which is down the road in Antarctica. Which you'll know if you watch the terrific prequel. Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> God, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, I not even thought about that. No, that, uh, that may or may not contain an alien being just that is a shapeshifter. <laughs> and uh, you can never quite tell who or may or may not be this alien uh, entity. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, that's, that yeah. was that was pretty good. Yeah. That's what I did. And this, of course, is the first chance he got to remake a movie by Howard Hawks, his biggest. Although well, Howard Hawks did not technically direct it, he produced it. The, I wasn't clear on that. Yeah, okay. it's uh, it's it's his, the thing from another world, Christian, which by the way is the movie they watch in Halloween. It is indeed. Um, uh, and not a not a bad movie. Have you guys, if you haven't seen the the thing from another world. We went to go check it out. We saw it in the theater. We got I've lucky. I've still never seen the original. It is I have not. very cool. It's a really cool... Um, it's it's similar in the sense that they're, they're sort of isolated in this thing. The thing is more like a Frankenstein-type monster. But as far as like low-budget 50s sci-fi, it's great. And there's an amazing effect where they set the thing on fire... And it's all practical. It's really terrific. But so. it's a drastically different film. Though. Very, um, very. Yeah, yeah. You wouldn't. You would have never envisioned this movie from that movie. And I think this again, bottle paranoia film out of a classic Cold War paranoia <laughs> sci-fi movie. No, and again, that's why Carpenter is Carpenter. Yeah. He saw this movie in a way I don't think anyone had quite seen. And and I want to kind of bring this up. And I think this is the first instant of it. Um, and The Void is a good example of this, is sci-fi horror is fairly rare, and it's even more rare that it's well done. Um, to merge those two genres together is, is, it seems obvious, like peanut butter and chocolate kind of thing, but it's not easy to do. And I feel like The Thing is this perfect amalgam of these two amazing genres. And Carpenter continues to experiment with this throughout his career, 
this is probably the, his masterpiece, obviously. I mean, it's his masterpiece on many levels. Yeah. But and probably first, even more than Halloween, I, I agree would say. With and that the first chapter well in his self titled Apocalypse trilogy, yeah. which are maybe my three favorite, like, on a personal level, Carpenter yeah. films. Yeah. Ooh, we're going to have fun later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get, all right. It's oh, on, man. It's on. Put it on my boxing gloves. I, I think what I want to say about the thing is yes, the thing was not particularly well received in its time. Um, and, and it wasn't until probably the mid to late nineties. I remember there was a, a creative screenwriting magazine and they did a retrospective on the thing. And this is right about the time. I think people had started to reevaluate the thing, started to see it as sort of the horror masterpiece that now we all just kind of agree that it yeah. is. Um, anybody who disagrees is wrong. It's yeah. totally wrong <laughs> and objectively. Wrong. And I, I will fight them. And, and so, but there was a really great thing. Anyways, this creative screenwriting done this retrospective. And then I think the next issue, they had the little letters column. And it said, some of us have been saying that the thing is a masterpiece since 1982. Signed, Frank Darabont. Ah, oh, amazing. Really? That's pretty awesome. It's just if that anybody great. anybody was going to feel that way, it was going to be Frank It was going to be Frank Darabont. Yeah. And I think, yeah. I, I remember the first time I saw the thing, it certainly wasn't around the theatrical release, but it was when I was a teenager. And my friend said, you got to see it. It's so amazing. And when I saw it, it was. It's a truly great movie. It's a great experience as a movie. It's a serious chunk of cinema. And 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 so I, I don't want to limit it to just say it's a great horror movie. It's a great sci-fi movie. It's a great movie. Period. I'll put it – period. Yeah. Amen. I'll put it up against Lawrence Arabia. I'll put it up against great, Schindler's List. More, like yeah. any other kind of movie. And I, I think that's something else I want to say about this, which is Carpenter – um, follows the the same kind of thing that Lucas and Spielberg were doing, which is Lucas and Spielberg had sort of decided that genre movies were not this thing that should be ghettoized, that they should make these really great movies that they loved from their youth on a really great level, and they could talk about other things within these films. And yet, and yet they were not supporting the guys who were, the Carpenter, who was doing that with horror. No one was. It is weird that Lucas and Spielberg, there isn't a Steven Spielberg produces a John Carpenter movie. Oh, they yeah. take his DP <laughs> and make Jurassic Park. But it does feel weird that, yeah, like this guy is the guy who's championing, championing the horror movies he grew up with and going, we can do these where they are art and they are amazing and they are really that great. But, Everybody ha else hadn't caught up with that memo, whereas, like, Lucas and Spielberg are like, oh, no, but, you know, the boulder rolling down and, they're like, Batman and whatever, you know, yeah. I mean, like, uh, that sort of adventure, but not horror. That's too far. That's still trash. Well, yeah. And a lot of you read the critic reviews of the time, and it's so clear that was the atmosphere. Oh, it's a horror movie, so therefore it's, it's trash. It must be, yeah. you yeah. know, and no one would even consider that it wouldn't. Could could possibly? I, I'm telling you though, anybody who watches it today, they'll see it as genius. Like yeah. whatever that mindset was at that time yeah. is, is completely like dead now. Because I, mean, I remember I didn't watch this movie for the first time till dead. not completely dead. No, but I mean, intelligent so people, people that, that, that like get horror. you know, yeah. I didn't watch till like the '90s, uh, you know, early '90s, um, and I thought it was genius the first time I saw. It. I was like, holy hell, how they do that with the dog? How they do that with you know the body? And like, it, it was genius. They did it and, by near killing Rob Botten. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and there's so many. It was great worth moments. it. I mean, there's so many great moments, but there's also these subtle moments in the, the thing that the you bodies. absolutely loved, like. For for example, when Kurt Russell checks on uh, Wilford Brimley's character Blair after they like, and, the like noose so, is in the background. and there's just like this noose casually oh. hanging there, and he's just like, yeah, "Yeah, I'm eating my food, or I'm I'm writing my letter, or whatever." It's, but there's this noose, and, and you're just like, and "Holy shit! Why does anybody see using how awesome that, that is?" Using that wide frame, and he and he just like he tells the story visually, like. Here's what this guy's telling you. He's very. Calm. I want to come back to the to the place now. I think I'm good. And you see the noose. Yeah, in the back and you're just like, yeah, and, I'm good. And again, I think also Carpenter. So so ambiguity in films is something that I think a lot. And I think horror fans, sci-fi fans, are more comfortable with the idea of an ambiguity in a film. They don't necessarily need an explanation like where does Michael Myers come from? What does he What does he need? Like we don't we don't necessarily want that. We mm -hmm. want to be scared. And I think. Something like The Exorcist or whatever succeeds because they don't want to explain everything. And Carpenter is a director who is very okay with ambiguity. Yeah. And the thing, more than I would say almost any of his other movies, traffics in ambiguity where he has like whole chunks of story where you're not sure. Like all of a sudden our main character who's basically Kurt Russell leaves the camp 
to check on like a light on in a in a in another place in the camp and we don't go with him we instead stay with these other characters and they make decisions and we don't ever really know what happened out there and i think carpenter's um use of something like ambiguity and there's so much of it in this movie and i think used so well it doesn't turn you off you aren't like oh man what the fuck happened or whatever instead you feel the dread mounting in a way that it doesn't mount in other movies because he deploys it so well. This It's really claustrophobic. It is. Well, what I like about this film is it's, you know, it's, again, Rio Bravo in a way where it's a group of people yeah, stuck again, inside in a thing, and it's freezing cold outside. Yeah. But what he did that was genius was somebody on the inside was trying to kill you, mm-hmm. not somebody from the outside. Yeah. Then you've got things like Prince of Darkness, which is both those together. Mm-hmm. Someone yeah. on the inside who changes bodies pretty much, mm-hmm. and... There's, you know, Alice Cooper on the outside. The, the miracle of the thing is that it worked awesome at all avoid. because yeah. it was his first really working in collaboration with a major film studio mm-hmm. film where it was like they didn't want Carpenter. They asked him originally kind of like, well, we're just looking for somebody. He was like, no, 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 I'm not that interested. Like, I, I would love to do that, but I got other stuff I'm working on. And then he it came back around to where he did end up working on it. Not the first film that was that way for him. Uh, Christine, same story. Like, he was originally apparently working on an adaptation of Firestarter mm-hmm. at that point, and then it yeah. came back around to him. Uh, Speaking of Christine, but, which is our next They movie. went to, like, <laughs> eight different leads like that they wanted really bad before it came down to Kurt Russell, who I think at this point was still being considered as that guy who was in all those Disney movies. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's Thank hard God. to imagine and that he was the guy who Kurt was Russell the computer who wore tennis shoes, you know, I yeah. mean, he was, he was a cutesy, <laughs> like uh, you know, the equivalent of like a Disney television actor in a lot of people's heads. Oh, so good in this movie. You know, and now you're like, wow, this guy is the top guy. Movies. Yeah, it's weird. I guess Despite already say- having been in Escape from New York at this point, that was not like... I mean, I guess we were kind of dealing with the beginning of the VHS era at this point, so people still hadn't really twigged in a larger sense to Russell being this badass type character. But him being cast, I think, is the key to this film. It, it, Agreed. You know, him and his silly hat. Hey, Swedes. Hey, Swedes. <laughs> you know what else is really interesting? Didn't I read somewhere that Ennio's score got like a Razzie nomination? It, it, nominated for yeah. Razzie for Razzie. It's yeah. like, this people is, are idiots. So... Guillermo del Toro. I've read this. This is great. Did you read that? Yes, yes. Go ahead. So, go ahead. if you're a fan of this, um, uh, you should go back and I, you probably, I think you can search for it because people have compiled it. Guillermo del Toro kind of went off on Twitter about Carpenter. And this is probably something I should say for the end, but in a good way. In yeah. a good way. Yeah. Which was, he said, like, why are we not celebrating this guy's career? Like, he he played with genre. He did amazing stuff. There's no one who has a filmography quite like this guy. Nobody that made movies. And he mentioned going out to dinner with Carpenter and saying, bring up the thing. And saying, um, yeah, but, you know, man, you made this movie and they didn't get it at the time. But now we all get it. And I think, you know, he's referencing this idea that we're all talking about, like, Carpenter is so ahead of the game. He is so seeing where the ball is going to go before the rest of us see it. Um, Which, unfortunately, is a Derails his career in a lot of ways. Like, where he's on this rocket ship, and he sort of should be the next Spielberg, and instead he sort of stays as a a low-level B-movie director, which is great, but has his problems for Carpenter, obviously. And, um... He was at dinner with Carpenter, which I love those two guys at dinner, right? Like, who wouldn't want to be at that table? And uh, and he says, yeah, you know, but now we all get it. And Carpenter said, yeah, but what good does that do me now? Yeah. I'm sure there was an F-bomb in there, too. Yeah, that's... I'm yeah, sure that's it was fine. like, what I'm fucking sure good does it do me now? good does that do no, me now? Like he's, he's jaded, man. I'm I don't, telling you. Know, he was, I think he's jaded. jaded, like, when he's making Halloween. Like, I think the guy is just a cranky, cigarette-smoking... How different would his career be, though, if he had been really recognized and had got started getting Spielberg-level budgets and credits, as opposed to what actually ended up happening, where he was trying to do the exact same thing Lucas and Spielberg were doing, but for whatever reason, the studios didn't get it. And so they didn't support it. And the audiences didn't. And the audiences yeah. didn't. Yeah. It was out of his time. And stuff he did that is now considered to be classic didn't make any money. And so he went, had to go back to being an independent filmmaker. You know, this is the guy that set the definition of 
the most successful independent filmmaker of all time with Halloween. Yeah. $300,000 budget made $70 million in its initial theatrical run. Yeah. That's like it's Blair 70s Witch money. Project like yeah. comparison yeah, size. But money, in retrospect, you know? look at Cronenberg. He put on his daddy pants and got back to fucking work and made good movies. He so, did. Yeah. You and know so, what? Up, but how it up. That's what I'm saying. Think <laughs> it's a bit, and I know? also think this guy gets it as far as like branding. Yeah. Just like he sees the future like John Carpenter's The Thing. John Carpenter's Halloween... Nobody else. Wes Craven's Dracula 2000. Uh, <laughs> oh I don't even know how much control he has over, over that. I think people that buy his movies go, we got to put your name on the top. They're going to sell it like that. I don't know how much control he has over yeah. that. Um, I think he wanted it. I mean, I definitely I mean, think it's something he wanted. I don't think anybody's just going to let you put your name on it. unless. You uh, I mean, contractually on some of these things later on in life, you never know. It could be like, hey, we want you to do this movie, but it's got to be John Carpenter's whatever. <laughs> it's true. Maybe so. You never know. Let me talk about a little bit. There's a lot of interesting there- Oh, oh, you my know my favorite one is. My favorite uh, also, one. I want to make a side technical note. Um, if you've only watched this movie on DVD, you need to get the Blu-ray. It's really good. Um, it's beautiful. Did you watch it? I watched it at somebody else's house. I Recently? Like only yeah, we're kind of a, couple months, a couple months back. Yeah. 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 It is, I had the DVD. It's gorgeous. And I had seen it multiple times. I got the Blu-ray. No, I didn't get a chance to look at the extra features. Does it actually it's have not even all about the, the extra deleted features. scenes? It may. It has all this amazing stuff. I assume stuff. it still doesn't have the but long since sought It's not even that. Film it's just end. that the <laughs> film looks so fucking amazing. Yeah, yeah. Like, I've seen all of Carpenter's movies, but this movie on Blu-ray, if just you... Beautiful. it's It's... Dude, you have to go out of your way to see it. Like, it looks amazing. Like... He really did something special with it. So go out of your way to see it on Blu-ray if you haven't. Such nice. a great movie. Doesn't have to be the sh- yeah. It's one of those movies that like I like. I think Shout Factory is the ones who re-released they it. They did, but, yeah, but actually, um, but I'm um, still like the the, 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 the actual Factory. company re-released it. The same company. Some, whatever. Yeah, I have the original Blu-ray release, but and I'm, even that was relevant. But I'm still like, you know, this is one of those t- chances that I want Criterion to step up and go, guys. This is one of the. Michael Bay movies and they're like oh, the rock, no, that, was, that was because there was corporate connections but even yeah. so they were forced to do that really not because they like wanted those releases to. But, but whatever um, right. but, but you know that was one of those like hey guys force you're not a bunch of show yourself you're not a bunch of old buddy duddies and give that same love and credit to a film that's definitely a classic like the thing it but, is uh, a game changer and I think that its influence is far reaching yeah um, alright all right. so what's our Bits of trivia. Trivia. This was written by Bill Lancaster, son of Burt Lancaster, who only wrote two other movies. Bad News and Bears. And the Bad News Bears go to Japan. <laughs> you and both the Bad News Dude, and the thing shut. goes to Japan. Yeah, the, the, um, also, I would watch uh, that. Also, side note, there's an amazing video essay where the guy talks about... Um, uh, you can only watch part of it. I think you have to buy the video essay. But he talks about the fact that Carpenter actually got stalled making the movie. And he had to rethink a lot of things. And so, to a certain extent, there's a couple of scenes where you say, wait, who was the thing? Was the thing this person or why? <laughs> and if you go back, he does explain Carpenter had figured out, like, there's sound cues and stuff like that, like people dropping keys, things like that, that explain all that. So, oh, yeah, really Carpenter, yeah, Carpenter really thought it all through. Uh, the only there's no uh, no females women. in this movie. In fact, even behind no the scenes, women. there aren't any women. There was one wow. lady on the set, and she had to leave. I think for like a, she she injured herself or something in the first week. So there's literally no except for his then wife Adrian Barbo. Yes, who, who plays was, the, was brought into the voice of the computer. The computer. Yeah, she was the, the major chess. major Barrett of the. Yeah. Uh, like, did they bring her in for that? I did that in post. She recorded it in post. Yeah, I'm like she wasn't there to like. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Well, because of studio requests, Carpenter actually filmed a happy ending version of the film. Boo. Which no one's ever seen. <laughs> no one has ever seen. And I don't want to. It was filmed. It was finished in post. And he never allowed it to even be screened at festivals for testing. He was like, I hate it. It's Good not going to work. And no one's ever seen it. And he's never allowed it to be released on any subsequent re-releases of it. Watch it be genius. And One day we're going to be like, God, it was Carpenter. genius. I, just, I know, yeah. right? And Carpenter is really good at the ambiguity, you know, the ambiguous ending. And so even, I guess even Keith David didn't know whether or not he lived or died. And he that is not. something that, yeah, to this day. And I think that's, to me, that's one of the strengths of the, the thing, which is... Uh, the the movie ends, but the story goes on. Mm-hmm. All right, so the, yeah. on that, there was a video game sequel that Carpenter still says is canon, is what happens next. Strangely enough, came out in 2002, I played it. It's an okay game. It's a good game with control problems. 
which yeah. I think is the reason that had turned a lot of people off because it was like points. You're like, I can't move out of this corner. I didn't so think like it was possible one. for this podcast to get more nerdy, but, but it, it just did. Just, <laughs> yeah. And I did, and like in the last third, <laughs> Kurt, uh, Kurt Russell's character shows up as McReady, and he survives along with the main character. They're picked up by a search and rescue scene, uh, team, and it's revealed that Childs froze to death, which Carpenter has said that's what happens. But apocryphally, and multiple people have reported that they've heard this, Carpenter hasn't commented one way or the other, but nobody can find a recording of it anywhere. Uh, in an interview that at the end McCready is breathing and Childs is definitely not and he was shocked that nobody could tell that that was the case. Like he thought that was supposed to be super evident that, that Keith David's character was not breathing and clearly was infected by the parasite. Once again, possibly apocryphal, but in contradiction to that, Keith David in interviews has said, if that's true, nobody ever told me to not breathe during that final scene. So mm. that kind of denies that that was, in fact, the, the, the possible case for that. Thing. Just lets you know it's a genius movie when there's that much trivia, history, Agreed. backstory, yeah. things going on. Oh, yeah. You know it's a great movie. As well, in 2004, Carpenter in an Empire Magazine interview said that he's had this story idea for The Thing 2, which evolves, or survive, goes around those two surviving characters. Uh, but... Ultimately, Universal Studios were like, okay, we're not really interested at the price tag. Even though Kurt Russell and Keith David were both like, yeah, we totally would do this completely. I'm interested. Even though it was so many years later, Mm -hmm. his reasoning was, yeah, they're a lot older, but we'll explain it by the fact that they both have severe frostbite. Um, (laughs) You're not entirely sure that frostbite is a plot point, but okay. Yeah, there is a comic book sequel. There is uh, a comic from book Dar- from I think Dark Horse, oh, but maybe? that Carpenter does not consider to be canon. Okay, yeah, yeah it's, not great. It's, not it's not great. It's not. It's not very good. Um, like by the way, canon. interesting thing: <laughs> there's a character named Mac and a character named Windows. Just throwing that out there. Thought that was kind of Boo. funny. Yeah, both of which was around were before the Macintosh was it was in fact or Windows were introduced. Is there a ca- that is some deep nerd shit. <laughs> it, it, it really is. And then there's HP and. <laughs> Asus. <laughs> Don't forget about Dell. Uh, as, <laughs> as well, this is just fun. It's a long-standing tradition at British a- Antarctic research stations to watch the thing as part of their mid-winter winter feast and celebration so on every June 26th. I mean, that's that's right. been going on for you decades. Got they it. always watch the thing. Carpenter has said this is his favorite movie of any of the movies that he's made, and honestly... I think it, it's clear. I mean, the thing definitely has... You can tell that's... That was his passion project. Mm-hmm. Oh, like, yeah. he loved this movie. I mean, even though, like, when the movie was over, the only people who thought this was a good movie was John Carpenter and Rob Bott. And Frank well, Darabont, apparently. He, uh, but, again, no, but, I mean, uh, like, and before it was even released. Yeah. Everybody else thought this was going to be a bomb and a disaster. Well, when Del Toro uh, tweeted that, um, that, that rant about Carpenter and, and how great his filmography is, how, how sort of individual and special it is, um, one of the producers on the thing, I can't remember which one it was, said, uh, yeah, I just want to chime in here. I worked on this movie with John Carpenter, and um, on Monday I showed up at his house the day after the first box office receipts came in, and he had aged 10 years. I believe He it. said he did not even look like this. It was a tough person. shot. Shoot, they were like, they filmed some of it actually in an Arctic location. Yeah. And some of it in a... 40 below zero sound stage. <laughs> I mean, oh, when, you, when you talk about the first... I remember my brother saying, because he saw it before I did, and he was like, you can't believe the first five minutes of this movie. And you do. It's like this amazing score and this helicopter chasing a dog in the snow tundra. It's stunning. Yeah, it's yeah. pure cinema. There's nothing like it. And you're like, what is happening? It's genius. That yeah. is genius. Again, another genius intro. And, and yeah. for the record... The translation of Norwegian pilots' words during oh, that yeah. sequence oh, yeah, yeah. has actually been released. Of course, obviously, some, some guy Norwegian yeah. says, "Get the hell out of uh, get uh, get the hell out of there." That's not a dog. It's some sort of thing. It's imitating a dog. It isn't real. Get away, you idiots! Yeah. And side note: if you like um, uh, commentaries on uh, DVDs, uh, Carpenter and Kurt Russell. Do the thing, and it's great. I still haven't listened to that, it's but great. I should have. On the Blu-ray, yeah, it's. Really, I should have listened. Really to that. cool. Well, I'll tell you what, we're like at over an hour. Let's break this up into two podcasts, where it's like the first half of unquestionably like the rise of Carpenter, okay, and the second half of like the middle and fall of okay. Carpenter I mean, for so, the second episode. Sorry, podcast listeners, sorry. you gotta listen to both episodes. You get two sorry, Carpenter not sorry. Yeah. You should get two Carpenter episodes because it's fucking John Carpenter. Should do like ten. So, so we're back to the first in our ten-part series. <laughs> 
John, John Carpenter. Next, we'll examine his experiences with cutting his fingernails and toenails. What was it like? How did it influence his I know, patients like, oh, the Star Wars would have liked that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they would have watched that. The they thought Wars it was really like cool. so into it. But you know what I find interesting? You said he aged like 10 years after that. He's looked the same for like 20 so years. Yeah. He looks like Johnny Knoxville and Jackass like when he dresses like, up as an old like man. He's got, uh, he's got brown hair and a mustache when he makes fucking Halloween, and the rest of the time he looks like he looks now. He, yeah, he looks like, like a caricature of an old man. Like, if yeah. you were to do someone in makeup to be an old man, always. And he's always, he always had that same that's look. That's what's going to happen to me after part two. Don't smoke, kids. That's what I'm going to look like after this podcast. When you're done. 